Let's take a step back. Uh, as we say, we had really low, historically low interest rates for a long time. A lot of people took a lot of debt on, and now they've come back up. So where do you see the most debt amassed out there? Uh, thank you for having me again on the show. I, I think when you zoom out today and try to look at the overall context, I think there are at least four sets of balance sheets that all are carrying an awful lot of leverage relative to historical levels and in many ways unsustainable amounts. The first one is the federal government itself, which is sitting with $35 trillion of debt and managed to amass the last trillion in record time, something like 106 days. And the pressure that refinancing that debt, which has relatively short average maturities, is a lot of pressure on interest rate markets generally. So that's the first balance sheet. The second one, I would say, is corporate balance sheets. And as you mentioned, if you give something to people for free, they take on a lot of it. And what was free was debt. So there's balance sheet after balance sheet after balance sheet in the corporate world, mostly in private equity sponsored companies, where the level of debt is six, seven, eight times EBITDA. And those maturities are rapidly advancing. And the rate of interest on, those debt, on that debt is quite high. Uh, most of the floating rate debt was not fixed and refinancing the old debt today is, is expensive. The third set is real estate balance sheets. And in many cases, people might have swapped or capped their interest rates for two years or three years, but they didn't cap it for 20 years. Or if they fixed their interest rate, it might have been fixed for five years or seven years or 10 years, but you're well into that period. And when you have to refinance into a 6% plus environment from a 3% environment, you can't sustain as much debt, so it leaves a gap, and there's going to be a lot of uh, interesting opportunities in those balance sheets. And the final balance sheets that are really um, a little bit out of whack are banks, both uh, national uh, uh, critical banks like uh, that, that own a lot of commercial real estate loans, as well as regional banks. And we're starting to see some of the exposure in those balance sheets. And what it's causing, while, while they're slowly tiptoeing back into the lending business, it's really constraining a lot of those activities that they might otherwise engage in. Some of these enterprises are good, solid, going concerns. They just have a problem with the amount of leverage they have. Some are more flawed in their basic business plan. When are we going to sort out, if I can say, uh, the sheep from the goat? When are we going to see some bankruptcy? Some of these people really go away. You're, you're starting to see it. Uh, the, the number of bankruptcies has gone up statistically by quite a bit. And the place where you see that good company versus bad company in the most um, extreme light is in real estate. You see um, bad real estate. And what I mean by that might be uh, markets that are having outflows of people that are never recovered from the COVID work at home phenomenon, uh, where there are outmoded buildings that might have been built, like office buildings that are that are somewhat obsolete, um, that don't look like they're ever recovering, that were sold for a price of X, and now the debt is trading at 50 cents or lower and the keys are being handed over. So those are really bad assets with bad balance sheets. There are other properties in real estate that are very good assets. Uh, let's just take simple multifamily in very good markets, fully leased, et cetera. Maybe rents are a little soft, um, but they're still okay, fully occupied. But the balance sheet, when it has to be refinanced, when the construction's completed, the building is done, it has to be permanently financed, the rate of interest is in the sixes, it's not in the threes. And therefore, the proceeds that can be maintained in a sustainable way are maybe half what the sponsor was expecting. Now, I'm going to guess that Canyon Partners is more interested in the second of those than the first of those. Uh, that, so where are you seeing opportunities right now? Canyon Partners, where are you seeing you can step in and really play a significant role in really restructuring some of these? Sure. Well, there are certain deals that are just liquidations or pure bankruptcies, the FTXs of the world and others. Those can be very, very interesting and last for a certain period of time. Those are a little bit anomalous, maybe. The much more systematic pattern is good company, bad balance sheet, six and a half, seven, seven and a half times EBITDA, but the value really does exceed the debt. It, it requires a careful study of what rights you have versus the borrower and what rights you have versus the other creditors because we're in a gloves off environment and people try to take advantage of their positions to fix the balance sheet in a way that advantages themselves. Uh, to what extent is the federal government on your side, if I can put it that way, in really handling these restructurings because you're taking the banks out of the play to some extent? It, it is in a way. Um, you certainly see this in things like, again, if you look at real estate, um, not only are the capital charges on advancing any money to an office 
building loan enormous for a bank to the point where it's really prohibitive. But in addition, the regulators will be jawboning you all day long, telling you not to do that if you're a bank. So basically, the banks really can't be the ones to deal with the 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 the, the maturities that are coming up and the over leveraged situations in in the real estate world. In the corporate world, I think the banks started out by fighting the private credit people by being a little too aggressive. And before you knew it, they had on their own balance sheets a lot of loans that weren't worth par, whether it was Citrix or whether it was Twitter or whether it was Viasat or others. You're now seeing them work through that and you're seeing a little more aggressiveness in the banks doing things like debtor and possession loans in bankruptcies and maybe providing a little more competition. But, it, but it's not so much in the more complicated um, capital solution, how do we lend a little money here and restructure that there. That's not so much what they do. But in the straight um, private credit, let's do senior lending, there, there are some signs of life again by the commercial banks. And, and finally, Josh, some of us spend a lot of time speculating what the Fed is going to do. Uh, when are they going to cut rates? How much are they going to cut? How often? But uh, I'm curious about a sensitivity analysis for you. Uh, what is the difference for you whether the Fed, let's say, just holds firm around 5% for a while as opposed to cuts 100 or 150 basis points over the course of the next year? Does that make a lot of difference in your business? It, it can, but not necessarily. And what I mean by that, we've, we've been sort of in the higher for longer camp for a while on the theory that Jay Powell is a very bright guy, obviously, and he doesn't want to use every arrow in his quiver unnecessarily. And as long as the stock market is healthy, and as long as uh, unemployment remains very low, and as long as inflation looks like it's more or less under control, why should he rush and use the, the weapon of lowering short duration rates so dramatically so quickly? So I think the market has really misread some of his signaling and some of that might just be taking a victory lap because of the successes he's seen at taming inflation. Um, my own view is the Fed's inflation numbers are artificially high. I think if you look at real housing costs and you talk to the people who own collectively hundreds of thousands of residential units across the country, even in the best markets, rents are basically flat. Most people aren't um, moving from their home because their mortgage is low, so their occupancy costs are flat. So. To say inflation, because of some metric that the Fed is using, is 6%, and that's 30% of inflation, I think you're overstating inflation by as much as 1.8%. So I think inflation is actually pretty, pretty benign right now. The economy is doing pretty well. So why should the Fed suddenly lower rates in a world that's already pretty, pretty, running pretty hot? The economy is doing pretty well. The long end of the curve is another story. And I think it can be a little more difficult no matter what, for the Fed to tame the long end of the curve, even with eight trillion sitting on their own Fed balance sheet, it, it, it's hard to see why that number should come down really materially. And, and when you're doing things that are stressed in the market, where these types of refinancings for companies that have to wean themselves off an overly bloated balance sheet, you're talking about 15% plus returns on your money. They're not really that closely related to what maybe the higher grade high yield index is trading at or where low rates are. They might give people a little more confidence and push more people into buying things at the long end of the curve, but we're not that dependent really on what the Fed does in the short run. But my bet is still that um, the Fed will take its time.